Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, what an important day for the Netherlands. I'm really excited for you, for Europe as well. Today, we're going to talk about lighting Europe. And of course, not only lighting Europe, we are talking about the future of the lighting industry, <clears throat> at least how we see that in lighting Europe. Here in the room, do you know what lighting Europe is? Everyone? Is there anyone never heard lighting Europe before? Okay, that's a good audience. Thank you. <laughs> voilà, that's, the, that's my first slide. So to introduce to you what lighting Europe is, you need to know who are the members. And so if you have a look, half of them are associations. And I would like to highlight here the presence of Ahoria, of course, from Belgium, and Fed at NLA. They are our Dutch members, Ahoria, uh, of course, our Belgian members. And we are very happy to cooperate with you, Grundit Flanders, and the other organizations organizing the event today. You see that we also have a number of companies that are direct members of Lighting Europe. So let's say half and a half. Half are national associations, half are uh, companies. Not all of them are big companies, if you may see. For example, I would like to show you that Waypoint, for example, and Stone Lighting are small companies. So small companies as well should not be afraid to join Lighting Europe. They can take part, they can contribute, and together with us shape the future of the industry legislation. Lighting Europe has a new strategy, at least. We'll have it very soon. I just started in Lighting Europe in June. Uh, I was already working for Lighting Europe since 2016 as a policy director. I was working in, in policies around eco design, sustainability. But since June, I'm now the new secretary general. I replaced Rania Gurguzzago. Maybe some of you had the chance to know her. And of course, I start and I have a big challenge in front of me. A new strategy has to be finalized by, by the board and by, by Lighting Europe. The board is also new, just appointed at the end of March, and they said, okay, let's do that. So we organized a couple of workshops, uh, one in May and another one in September, where we collected uh, the views of our members and see what do we need to do, what else Lighting Europe needs to do to better support and better serve the lighting industry. That was the question. And it was a bit funny and a bit sad, because one of our members said, you know what? Lighting Europe is such a great organization. You do great lobbying. You can influence rules about lighting, eco design, energy labeling, April, name it. But then we would have the best uh, organization in Europe. And then we realized in 2030 that the patient is dead. I was like, OK, <laughs> let's start. <laughs> let's start well. So there, is a bit of, there was a bit of. Uh, pessimism in the room. I noticed there was, I mean, w willingness to do, w to do good, to do well, to do better. And at the same time, we saw some threats in the air, in, on the horizons towards 2030. So then Lighting Europe should then do even more than what is, uh, has been doing the past years. So true, Lighting Europe has been mainly a, a platform for lobbying, for influencing regulations and policies around lighting. Now we should do another step forward, keep doing what Lighting Europe is doing, and on top of that, add another mission. The mission is to really become the platform for the lighting industry to speak with one voice. And the lighting industry should not only be the lighting manufacturing industry, the voice should be, together in the room, we should be with the specifiers, with the designers, but even the wholesalers, the retailers, and all those who are passionate about lighting and want to work with us. So that's the new mission of Lighting Europe. It's a draft, so allow me not to, uh, I mean, we cannot really publish it today. In a few days, will be approved by the board and then by the General Assembly. It's still a draft, but uh, the, the, the main, main messages are there. <clears throat> so we have a new vision for 2030. The vision is that we want to finally see that the value of lighting is widely recognized. 
that's the first request of the board and Lighting Europe. So that's the first point of the new strategy of Lighting Europe. Finally, the benefits of lighting should be recognized and lighting should be considered a highly valued product for life. And the European industry in 2030 should be flourishing, supported by good legislation, sound regulation that are also enforced because we could have the best rules in the world. But if nobody applies them, or few only, this is not ideal at all. Then, next to the vision, we have, of course, a mission. So what is my job as Lighting Europe? My job is to make sure that the lighting industry gets there. We realize that the vision becomes true, becomes reality. And so we want to have a, a European market where in 2030 the value of lighting is recognized, finally, and is supported by good legislation and we serve as a platform for the whole industry and a collaboration for all stakeholders, also collection and recycling. I was talking yesterday at Eucolight. Uh, you know, it's the, our sister organization. It's the European Association representing collection and recycling organizations um, in, uh, in Europe. And Lightrack is, is here just uh, behind this, this wall. They were there together with us yesterday. And the point is to make sure we align our aspiration as a industry and the policy goals of policy makers. And then we have four main objectives. The first one, the most important one, is now lighting comes first. This is our new motto. It should never happen anymore than in a project. Lighting is forgotten and is left as many times it happens. I'm sure you, you also share this frustration. Lighting is at the end of the process and is left when there is no more budget, where there is no more attention, and then we don't have then the right light because we have no money anymore, isn't it? Healthy marketplaces, EU industry as a global and technical leader and engaged key players. These are the four objectives. If we start with the first, as I mentioned before, so lighting should be the first, the first item to, be cons to consider in a new project. It seems very ambitious, isn't it? But that's, that's our vision. We want to get there. We want to work to, to make it happen. And is finally considered a highly valued product for life and and users and all people we work together with recognize the value of lighting. And so they are happy to give lighting the first place. And we also would like to give more and appropriate information to our end users. The second point is what is, has always been, let's say, at the heart of what we do in Lighting Europe, to have good rules. Good rules that are properly enforced. And what is the ambition? A level playing field. We are all subject to the same rules. We all apply the same rules. And we are not subject to companies that enter the EU market, maybe via an online platform, and just sell illegal products in Europe. That's what we unfortunately see uh, very much. Then it's an, uh, it's, a, it's an ambitious program, of course. We need some help. And who will be helping us? We decided in Lighting Europe something new. We need to involve the CEOs. Where are the CEOs? Are there any CEOs in, here in the room? No CEOs. Also in Lighting Europe, in the executive board, we have only one CEO. We mainly have in our board regulatory and standardization experts. We need somebody that knows about the business and can give us new suggestions and new and additional help. The, pro the, the problem is how to get there, how to, how to get healthy marketplaces. We're asking now this question to the CEOs of our companies. So Lighting Europe is organizing next year two CEOs event. So events only for CEOs where they can meet, where I can meet and they can discuss topics of relevance. And the first question, the first event will be at the end of January, will be only an online, so we start, uh, you know, with something, uh, a soft approach, then we will let them meet at the end of next year, 
and we will have then a good discussion about let's find together the solution. What is your opinion? How would you recommend we resolve this problem? They can finally give a say. And then let's go to the third objective. This is where we have to show our leadership. We have to become, we have to be even more a proactive leader, a proactive global leader, of course, in regulation, policy, standards, and when it comes to, of course, good lighting, lighting that is digitally, digital, adaptable, individualized, smart, and of course, sustainable and durable. How to get there? We need, the, again, the cooperation of who can help us, and I'm referring to, of course, our usual partners, ENEC, Eucolite, and other associations we work with, industry association for other sex sectors, for example, home appliances, ventilation, heating industry. We have a lot of partners in Lighting Europe, around Lighting Europe, and we have also have to address a very difficult point, difficult question how to manage the succession plan. How can we manage to let the seniors meet the youngsters? We have a lot of very uh, experienced senior professionals in our companies that are about to leave the market. And the youngsters hesitate to enter the market, and the risk is that they will never meet. And so we d they, the youngsters are not properly trained to take over and be as successful as the senior were. Last point, engage key players. This is the collaborative huh, aspects, the platform. We want to involve the CEOs, we want to involve also the small ones, the small associations, for example, I would say the association of countries that are not yet in lighting Europe, for example, or where the industry is not so strong, but is growing. And then we want to also have small companies. Small companies should feel comfortable in lighting Europe. They will receive attention. They will be able to write together with us the rules for the future of the lighting industry. So voila, this is our strategy. And now, the legislative tsunami, also uh, known as the U Green Deal. You're aware of uh, Mr. Timmermans' uh, role he played in the European Commission until a few months ago. Today he's running for the elections, let's see what happens. But the program that he put in place as a European Commission is extremely ambitious. And I would like to then give you an idea of what is happening in Europe. First of all, a typical topic that we discuss in Lighting Europe, the phase-out of products. Ross, eco-design, you've heard about these terms, I'm sure. They are all, what are they doing? They are all regulating the same products. What's the objective? To phase them out. To phase out inefficient products, this is the objective of one part of the commission, DG Energy, and to get rid of Mercury lamps. This is the objective of DG Environment. So we have two DGs, two Directorate Generals in the Commission, fighting for different objectives to uh, eliminate the same products. What we end up? We end up with a contradicting timeline, unfortunately. One decides to phase out T8 in that day, the other one to phase out T8 in another day, or T5, or CFL, and the others how to organize ourselves, how to know which rule apply first. We ask our commission, please help us. Come with a public statement. Tell the industry you have to phase out CFL by that day, uh, allergens by that day. They didn't come with any public statement, unfortunately. We're probably not a priority. I don't know what's the reason behind. But then we said, okay, lack of leadership there, let's do that, we can do that, you, Lighting Europe, puts together all brains of our experts, and we come with a good final table. Final, I mean comprehensive. It's never final because they're gonna phase out more products in the future. 
That is, uh, the, that is the, uh, the table. We have published this in, uh, on our website. This is the last version back in July. I hope you had the chance to see that. Ask your associations to uh, let you know. You can also download it from our website. Uh, uh, you go press release sections. And indeed, you see some things were happening only a few days ago, a few weeks ago. And the question I have for you is, did you tell huh, your clients? Did you tell public authorities? Did you tell retailers? Did you tell wholesalers that this is happening and they have to prepare for the transition to buy replacement, to move to LEDs? Did you talk to them? This is an incredible opportunity you have as a, as a market opportunity. And now, what we call the tsunami. Now we are going to winter season. Let's talk about avalanche. Indeed, the result is the same. It's a long list of legislative files, very ambitious to move towards more sustainable products. Of course, we perfectly share the ambition of the Commission. We need to move towards sustainable products. And I'm not complaining against Europe, because indeed, when Europe comes with legislation, this is a very big support for us because the alternative will be to have fragmented national regulations everywhere in Europe. And so you companies, for example, organizing this event today that are global, well, good luck to you if you have to fulfill different rules in Italy, in the Netherlands, in France, in Spain, in UK, then welcome Europe. Europe can come with harmonized rules. And this is where Lighting Europe can help the industry because we help shape the right rules for the industry at European level. <clears throat> so let's not be scared <coughs> about this regulation. It's not going to be easy, I know. It's going to be tough. <clears throat> we have to do a lot of work. But at least we are fighting for harmonized rules. <clears throat> Who in the room knows about ESPR? That's the, the, the first block on top. ESPR, does it sound familiar? <clears throat> To any of you? One. Ah, thank you. <laughs> One. Well, this is an extremely important piece of legislation. The ESPR is a strange acronym that means Eco Design for Sustainable Product Regulation. It means this is the new mother legislation of our Eco Design rules for light sources. Have you heard about the Eco Design? legislation, the single lighting regulation, isn't it? Are you aware of the ego design rules for light sources? At least this one, do you know? Are you following? Yes, okay, thank you. This is the mother legislation. It means that basic principle will be there and that specific rules will be in our specific rules, in our specific regulations, sorry. So you need to know the framework because some of these rules will apply already to our products immediately. Let's try another question. Um, what about sebum? Who knows about sebum? No one. Well, sebum is already applying. Reporting obligations by sebum are already uh, in application since the 1st of October. Sebum is Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism Regulation. It's a new regulation that is introducing obligations for the industry that are importing some raw materials from outside the EU, and I'm referring in particular to aluminium, you have to, first of all, report on the quantities eh, of raw materials you're importing from outside the EU, and then in a few years, you will be asked to pay allowances that cover the carbon content of this aluminium that is produced somewhere else, extra EU. You import a product that has some carbon content, you need then to pay, the, the, to compensate huh? the carbon content. So this is CBAM. CBAM starting 1st of October as reporting obligation. So you have to start checking how much aluminium are you uh, bringing to the, into, into e, the, EU, the EU market, and then you will have to report these numbers. And then in a couple of years, you will have to then start pay allowances. So this is extremely important for you to know. 
PFAS. Have you heard about PFAS? Yes, yes, a bit more. In Belgium, this is in the news every day. I'm getting crazy. Every day, the, every news, it's about PFAS. Because there was a scandal. These are the so-called so the eternal chemicals that have effects on our health in a persistent way. There was a leak of this PFAS in some regions in Belgium. And the population didn't know. It was in the, in the water huh? tube pipes and the population didn't know. Now the government of Belgium is trembling because of PFAS. This is an extremely important topic because Europe is preparing some rules to regulate the presence of PFAS and remove them from the market. So remove them from your products. You have to think about this will apply to all products, including lighting. So you have to prepare that products, uh, products that contain PFAS will have to find a substitute, so you have to prepare in advance. These are rules that are not yet officially on the table, but they're being prepared. Public consultation took place a few weeks ago. The Commission is preparing a draft, and this will apply around 27, 2027. So you still have a few years, but it takes a lot of time to understand which PFAS do you have in your lighting products, in your luminaires, for example, in your cables, and then to find an appropriate replacement with the same functionalities. You cannot find whatever replacement is. not So you have to work with your suppliers. You have to work in advance. So this picture, it's extremely complex. So we try to simplify that for you, just to concentrate on a few files where we are extremely active right now in Lighting Europe to defend the interests of the lighting industry. So the first one is the one I mentioned before, the ESPR, Eco Design Sustainable Product Regulation. This is a summary of what we see that is coming up for you and will be relevant for you. So the ESPR will introduce a reparability score for all products where it makes sense. Of course, if you think about lighting, it doesn't make sense for a lamp, isn't it? But for a luminar, does it make sense, a reparability score for a luminar? Maybe yes, isn't it? We could inform our end users about the level of reparability. And I know this is a topic that is widely discussed in the Netherlands. There was a project, I understand, still ongoing, to set up a reparability score for luminaires in outdoor lighting, isn't it? Your cities, municipalities, are extremely interested in this topic. But would you prefer a European reparability score or only one from the, the, the Netherlands? Maybe better than a normalized one, isn't it? If you are engaged also across the borders. So this is a threat, but maybe even more an opportunity, isn't it? Recycled content, critical raw materials requirement. We expect rules that will directly impact your luminaires, how you design your luminaires. You will have to integrate, very likely, portion of recycled aluminum or recycled plastics into your luminaires. So the lighting regulation as we know it, that is mainly about light sources and control gears, will move towards a more luminar approach. It will come with requirements on sustainability of luminars. <coughs> In particular, on recycled content, critical raw materials, this is more for the electronics, isn't it? So it's more for maybe the light sources. You will be asked to track the presence of critical raw materials in your light sources and maybe to integrate some recycled portions of critical raw materials. Digital product passport. Have you heard about digital product passport before? No? No one? So the Commission, Europe, is moving towards having digital product passport for all products. What does it mean? That you will buy, what you want to buy some clothes, you go to the shop, and then you can scan, QR code, uh, the, 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 the code of the, your product, of your, I don't know, skirt, and then the skirt will tell you where this has been produced, which substances it contains, if it has, if it's made of recycled content, if you can, is it's recyclable as well, if it's somehow repairable. So you will get a lot of information. You will get information requirement and to place them into a digital product passport. 
When it comes to lighting, we are in a bit of a special situation. Are you aware of, uh, about the April database? Do you know the April database? Yes? Yes, April database, okay, thank you. The April database is there. You have done a lot of work already. You place a lot of information for the light sources you place on the market in this database. So thanks also to our efforts, the commission recognized this uh, uh, effort and said, okay, lighting is not at all a priority for the digital product passport. We know you have the April database. We can get there a lot of information. We will not uh, move on with the digital product passport for lighting as a priority. We will concentrate on other products. So this is not very urgent for, for us. But still, it remains a topic in the air because April is for light sources, not for luminaires. So do we re are we really off the hook? Then, tracking of substances of concern. This is our favorite topic in lighting Europe. Of course, uh, I'm ironic. Substances of concern, as mentioned before, PFAS, is popping up everywhere. Europe is obsessed, I think, Europe, I mean, all countries are becoming obsessed about the presence of hazardous substances, and they want to regulate them first to understand which substances are where, and then to remove them as much as possible. That's the objective. Fine. How to get there? The SVR is asking all products to track the presence of hazardous substances. What is an hazardous substance? Is a, is a new concept that the ESPR is introducing. This is why the ESPR is so important. And this is the definition, you see, A, B, and C. And this is a, an estimation of more than 10,000 substances. It's, it's huge. How can we track the presence of 10,000 substances, even more? This is a conservative estimation. You need to talk to your suppliers. You get to pick up the phone today and start talking to your suppliers to understand, are you giving me any of these substances that are in this list? Because I need to know. Because then you need to tell me the quantities and even thresholds are not discussed or even traces huh, of these hazardous substances could be relevant. So you need to start today to talk to your supply chain, to your suppliers that are maybe on the other side of the world, I know, it's difficult, and they need to start to give you information about the presence of these substances in the product you place on the market, because then you will be asked to give this information to the authorities due to the SPR. Maybe in a digital product passport, maybe not, to be seen where, but you will have to be to give this information. Another topic that is affecting you, and this is coming extremely soon, is the prohibition of the destruction of unsold consumers' products. This is only for consumers' products, so I realize it's not for all of you, indeed, but some of you don't know if their product's gonna be for a consumer or not, isn't it? My members have the same problem sometimes. So, they don't know, maybe they are considered consumers' products, then you cannot just send your unsold products to your collection and recycling. It becomes prohibited. You cannot, because this is considered destruction of valid goods that should instead be somehow reused, remanufactured, given to somebody else. The uh, what is coming immediately is in already in February 24 is the reporting obligation about how many unsold con consumers goods do you have and how many are you destroying. So this is coming with the application of the ESPR, so February, March. One year later, so in February 2025, the ban will start, so you will not be allowed anymore to destroy these products. So it means you have to start right now talking to, for example, charities of your region and see, hey, would you like to receive my luminaires? I cannot destroy them anymore. I cannot sell them either because they have, I don't know, a little defect. Well, would you accept them? If you start talking to charities, for example, today, you can start creating opportunities for you to deal with this new obligation. 
Or you can think about, I can maybe remanufacture them. If I remanufacture them, I can create new opportunities, isn't it? So this is what the text is pushing you to do. And then, what's for, the, what's for us? So the SPR is the mother regulation. So only indeed the ban on the destruction of consumer's goods and the reporting obligation on consumer goods this will be applicable immediately, from day one, from March next year. But what, what is applicable for us at the end of the day as uh, lighting products? You have to wait the lighting regulation, so the eco-design regulation that will replace the current one, the 2019-2020, so the next generation of regulation. And there, there will be a lot of rules that we have already seen in the list before. You will have rules of tracking of substances of concern. You will probably have a reparability score and, and more. You will have maybe rules on uh, durability, probably on lifetime, on recyclability, on uh, critical raw materials, on recycled content. So this is on the right what we expect to receive. But these rules will only be applicable when the regulation will be designed, finalized, and published. So not before, let's say, 2027. So you still have a few years. You are in a lucky position. You still have a few years. You are not a big priority for the Commission. And so there is no hurry for them. But so you have time to prepare for uh, all this to happen. On the left is what we have already today. We have requirements on energy efficiency, on quality parameters, on basic circular economy uh, requirement. All of that, of course, will go to the next generation. We will have more ambitious energy efficiency requirement, more ambitious parameters on stroboscopic effect on flickering, for example, and, and more on reparability indeed. So what are we doing in Lighting Europe? Are we waiting like this until 2027 to see the text being published? Of course not. Since already two years, so basically when the Lighting Regulation was published, and the, you remember there was an omnibus amendment that modified some parts, in particular on stroboscopic effect, concluded this uh, file of work, we started to prepare for the future of the Lighting Regulation. Lighting Europe said we have to be quicker than the Commission, we can write ourselves the next single lighting regulation before the Commission does it, send them, share with them, and say, this is a possible new lighting regulation. If you do agree, for you, it's enough just to make some few changes, and then it's done. So that's our ambition. We are very ambitious, probably. But we are trying to do that. We are preparing already possible, feasible requirements on all these aspects, on all the things we know that are anyway coming. And this is where we already finalize our position. You see, there is a reparability score as well. This is what we are, it's a project in Lighting Europe. Not yet fully, fully, fully finalized, I have to be sincere with you. Will be concluded by the end of this year but we are thinking about a possible reparability score for luminaires because we think it's better to have reparability score for luminaires than mandatory requirements on removability of all pieces of a luminaire. So we see that as an opportunity. Lifetime, we're thinking about minimum lifetime requirements. We're thinking about how to regulate lighting controls. We know lighting controls will be regulated. Control gears as well will receive more rules. How can we get a more, I mean, uh, and better uh, list of exemptions? We cannot expect that the same list of exemptions we have today will be copy and paste in the next one. We have to propose something better. We are still uh, discussing four important, very important topics. So there we are not yet done, but I'm optimistic we can do that by the, let's say, June next year. We are thinking about requirements on re critical raw materials, recycled content of plastics and aluminium, energy labeling, which is also very important. We always leave it a bit to the end, I admit. Information requirements, especially for luminaries. Now, the next uh, pieces of the avalanche. I will be much quicker on this one, so the SPR is extremely important, the others a bit less, so we'll be quick and I will just give you some ideas what's coming up. 
So the eco design uh, ESPR is almost concluded. Negotiator at uh, the council, so the member states and parliament are discussing. A, a legislation will be ready soon, published in March. The right to repair is another piece of legislation which is setting new reparability requirement. And it's mainly for other products and lighting, but will be applicable to lighting as well once we will have more reparability requirements. There is, um, it, what is that about? It's about providing additional reparability services. Huh? For the moment we said it's not applicable to lighting, but there is something that will apply instead to lighting as well. Because the right to repair, such a new name, let's say, is not uh, nothing else but the review of a well-known piece of legislation, the Sales of Goods Directive, which is for consumers' products. So again, maybe it's not for all of you. But uh, this is uh, a, a legislation that applies to all of us. So the two years guarantee time is set there, you know? by the sales of good direct, this is reviewed, and the parliament wants to add something new. They say, if a repair happens during the first two years, during the legal guarantee that all of you have to uh, guarantee indeed, then the legal guarantee is extended of another full year. So this will have an impact on all companies indeed, because it's, it's for all products to be discussed yet, so we don't know how we'll end up. Green claims. This is a new piece of legislation, completely new, that is about fighting greenwashing. We see a lot of greenwashing, isn't it? My product is green, my product is more efficient, my product has 30% recycled content, my product is recyclable, blah, 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 blah. Is that true? There are a lot of labels, there are a lot of claims. The Commission says we have to stop that, we have to clean and only limit to the real green claims. Those that are really, really true and can be verified and substantiated. So they created a number of criteria that you have to fulfill to make sure that your claim is really substantiated. Otherwise, you are not allowed to make it anymore, you will be sanctioned. So for the moment, it looks good. The set of criteria makes sense, and we are happy with this legislation. Again, it's harmonization where national uh, authorities are already starting to, to uh, legislate at national level, so we deeply support these efforts. And um, it will only apply again to B2C, so I'm sorry again, but it could be relevant for, for some of you. What's popping up there? Again, the hazardous substances. So the commission text, you know, the legislative process was, works like this in Europe. You have a commission text and then a proposal and then the council and parliament, they come with amendments. Huh? And then at the end, they have to find an agreement in the, what they, we call trilogues. The parliament is trying to create amendments, I mean, to propose changes. And what do they propose? They say, Ah, if a product contains hazardous substances, it should not be allowed to make any green claim. Really? What does it mean exactly? What is an hazardous substance? If you are going to look at the details, copper is an hazard hazardous substance. Silver is an hazardous substance. Lead is an hazardous substance. So all of them are considered dangerous. It means that you have one of these, only one of these, you cannot make any green claim at all. So it means basically no electronics. No ele electronics can make any claim, isn't it? Because I, I, I challenge you, do you have a product that is an electronics and doesn't contain not a, even a bit of copper? But what about the cables, isn't it? So is that really the, the objective? Is that the right one? So we are really concerned about that. In this week, we have the European Parliament session in Strasbourg. You maybe heard it from the news. We are there. My colleagues are there to talk about the European Parliament. The members of the Parliament say, hey, guys, your proposal will exclude all electronics from this legislation. Is that what you're trying to achieve? So they're trying you know, to open the dialogue and let them think about what, uh, what are the right rules. 
empowering consumers. Again, it's for consumers. They, this is clearly the objective uh, uh, of this uh, commission, of the EU Green Deal. <clears throat> there are a number of new requirements, information requirements, to provide information about the sustainability of a product. And they are creating a new label. A new label, so being a new label for consumers' product, very quickly will end up being in all products, so will have an impact uh, on all of you. You have to now put a label on the product, uh, thanks to these rules that are not yet finalized. Huh? They're still being discussed. There will be a label that where you, all consumers will read <coughs> what is the duration of the legal guarantee, which is two years, or maybe a different one. Let's see the other file, how does it go? <coughs> you will have to put together the numbers of your national guarantee, if there are national rules that uh, unfortunately apply, plus the commercial guarantee. So a new label that will have basically three numbers to inform consumers how many years this product is guaranteed. And you have to then provide information about availability of spare parts, for how many years do you provide spare parts, cost, cost, of spare parts estimated as extremely intrusive, I think, as a, as a requirement. But this will be indeed part of the obligation. Maintenance, instruction, of course, all of that. Taxonomy. Who is familiar with taxonomy? No one. Taxonomy already applies. So these are a number of rules that uh, uh, it's a sort a series of reporting obligations that concern your product. Your product, if you claim them to be taxonomy compliant, it means that they are green, they have to fulfill a number of criteria. Do they contribute to climate change? Then the, the criteria are in the first delegated act on taxonomy called climate change mitigation delegated act. This is already there, published since at least two years. So in, in Lighting Europe, everyone knows this piece of legislation. And it's only about light sources and controls. So luminaires are not really there. But we have a new delegated act that is now about to be finalized. It's really on circularity. And there are a number of criteria that concern you read that manufacturing of triple E, so electric electronic equipment for industrial, industrial as well, not anymore consumers only, professional consumers use. So all of you, all of you will be impacted. To be considered green by the taxonomy, you have to have um, fulfill a number of criteria. Long lifetime, be repairable, highest populated reparability score. Ay, 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 we are proposing a reparability score, but are we sure our products will end up in the highest reparability classes? That's a good question to ask before we are done with, we are done with our proposals. Superior recyclability, reuse and remanufacturing, and again, our worst enemy or best friend, let's call it as you wish, presence of hazardous substances, again. Do you have lead in your product? Sorry, you're not taxonomy compliant. Do you have copper? Do you have silver? Sorry, you're out of the taxonomy. So these rules are extremely uh, strict. So we are, what are we doing in Lighting Europe? We have put together a task force which is thinking about how to amend these criteria. If they exclude all products, they shouldn't be the right ones, isn't it? They should be modified. So we are thinking about amendments and guidelines, how to fulfill reporting obligations concerning taxonomy. Because if you say that your product is taxonomy compliant, then you have to report on that in your sustainability report. You have to provide information how many of your products percentage are compliant with taxonomy. And many of you are doing that. Substances regulation. Well, again, substance is an extremely trendy topic. So on top of PFAS uh, conversation that we mentioned before, the conversation on hazardous substances in general, we know that less and less exemptions for mercury will be granted. And indeed, 
um, also the mercury regulation is aligned. Mercury regulation is the regulation in Europe to implement the Minamata Convention. Okay, all of that is mainly about mercury, so maybe it doesn't concern you so much. But then we still have REACH. REACH is the legislation on substances, and this is where PFAS huh, are regulated. The mother legislation, the REACH regulation, will be revised probably next year or the beginning of the following. ROS and REACH as well. So the two mother legislation of chemical products will be revised, both. Just to conclude uh, our uh, overview of uh, the U Green Deal, packaging and packaging waste. This also concerns all of you. There are new rules that are being discussed on packaging. Is it voted exactly today in the plenary in the European Parliament? So in Brussels, everybody's talking about packaging today, everyone. And uh, uh, there are new rules that we expect to be included in the final text. Three new labels, uh, rules on ma packaging minimization, reuse target for ta packaging. Some of them, in particular, the transport, the transport uh, packaging uh, will have an impact on you, on you as well. Voila. Before I conclude, and I see I'm talking already quite a lot, already 46 minutes, so I'm about to conclude, I would just like to uh, summarize what are we doing in Lighting Europe with all of that and other topics. First of all, I would like to mention PSR, LCAs and EPDs. Are you familiar with these terms? Yes? Anyone else? LCA? Yes? EPDs? Yes? Okay, this is a topic of relevance indeed. So more and more our clients are asking our industries to produce declaration about the environmental footprint of your product, isn't it? But then which model do you, do, will you use? Hippity Smart, Pepeco Passport, uh, Enor in Spain, uh, Ibu Berlin in Germany. There are different ways, isn't it, to declare the environmental footprint of a luminar, of a light source, of a lighting product. So in Lighting Euro we said, okay, let's try to help the industry. Let's align around one model. So if there is only one model, all your clients will have to adapt and say, okay, I recognize lighting in the, the lighting industry is giving us LCAs. With this model, we follow the model. If there is one model that is considered prominent and more important, then the market can adapt, isn't it? At least this is our hope. <clears throat> so what have we done? We said, Let's write these rules. Let's write the perfect rules to give the perfect picture of the environmental footprint of a product. So Lighting Europe reinvented herself, itself, joined an association called Pepeco Pass, which is a program operator active in France and also in other regions in, in Europe. <clears throat> they were revising the rules on luminaires for general lighting we decided to give our contributions with our members and we wrote them huh, together with our members. Also the small companies that I was mentioning before were in the room. <clears throat> These rules are now available. They've been published in July. There, if you go to the website of uh, Pepeco Passport, PSR rules, general lumin uh, luminous for general lighting, you can download them, you can follow them. You can make a declaration, LCA declaration, an EPD, with the rules that we also contributed to create. And what are we doing? Are we trying now to align <coughs> around a model that could be this one. <coughs> we are working with the Global Lighting Association, which is our mother association, so to make sure that the same rules are used in different regions of the world. We are talking to the specifiers, to the designers, the most active one, you know, the Green Light Alliance, maybe some of you have heard about them. We are cooperating, of course, <coughs> with our British colleagues with TM66. And we are already think we are talking to the different program operators, so they all align, IBU Berlin, EPD Italy, N, or all align on one set of rules. So you will not be asked to produce this and that model, but you will have one harmonized set of rules. <coughs> and we are already thinking about standardization. If you move to standardization, will be standards, then 
it's much easier, isn't it? So we are kicking off discussions in the IEC. So it's already on the agenda at the IEC. And then we are also working on components. We, we have rules for luminaires. We also need rules for LED modules, for control gears, for controls. So we are now writing, typing new rules to also cover these aspects. And as mentioned before, our members are very happy with what we do in terms of lobbying and influencing legislation. These are some success stories we, um, of, of the past months, but I will not uh, bother you too much with that. I would only maybe mention the last one, which is, I I'm really proud of that. Lighting Europe is becoming the reference in the Brussels arena <coughs> about enforcement of rules. We are those who shout the most. We are really recognized for our role <coughs> to ask that rules that are approved are actually enforced and uh, subject to surveillance of authorities. Otherwise, our members that fulfill rules are penalized compared to all others that do not fulfill the rules, isn't it? So we are together with Eucolite, our sister organization, Toys, Consumers Association, with NGOs, all together we talk and we fight to have good rules that are enforced. So in every piece of legislation, we're trying to have a strong section on enforcement of rules. We are also checking what's the status in the market with market surveillance uh, exercises ourselves, with, sorry, mystery shopping exercises. We are discussing with NGOs and other industry how to do more. So we're trying to really lead on this, uh, on this topic. This is just the last uh, point, a joint statement a few months ago. You see, it's, I, I'm, I'm so proud. Our logos together with logos of Greenpeace, WWF, uh, environmental activists, we are together, we fight for the same objective to make sure that these rules are finally uh, applied. Elections Day. To the, today in the Netherlands, in June, at the European level, European Parliament will be elected, new leaders will create the new European Commission, and they will drive the next set of rules. So, of course, in Latin Europe, we are working to prepare, we are finalizing a political manifesto with our request, what do we want to see policymakers should be doing in the next term of the European Parliament and the European Commission, and how this can support the industry. To conclude, some projects for next year. So if we officially launch our new strategy. We are creating for our members a legislative tracker. So because you will be asking yourself, how can I get all this information about all these pieces of legislation you mentioned? How do I know what is already approved, what will be applicable, and by when, when requirements apply? We are putting that together into a table with the LIA, so our UK uh, members, to make sure you can also follow the UK section, because you know UK authorities are coming with their own rules, unfortunately, which is becoming even more complex. So you will have in one place everything you need to know, at least the basics of timeline, of the most important pieces of legislation. So our members will receive that. <coughs> We're organizing two CEOs event. We will be a light and building. I hope you will also be there. In, uh, uh, it's the first week of March, the 5th of March in the afternoon, we will organize an event. We will discuss about the topics I mentioned to you. We will discuss with policymakers. They will be invited with industries uh, and other stakeholders. And we will also have a networking event. So all of you, you are invited. It will be free entrance. So if you're in Leiden building, of course. And I'm happy to, to meet you there. We are working on a lighting forum where we discuss with stakeholders about the value of lighting. This is what I mentioned at the beginning, the platform dimension. We are working on new rules on components. We are finalizing a political manifesto for the European elections. We are working on taxonomy with guidelines and amendments. And we are even updating an important guidance that maybe many of you know in this room, is the guide on performance of LED luminaires. It's really about lifetime and durability of luminaires that is dating back 2018. We want to update that. So this is another ambitious project we have. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We have some time for some questions from Welcome. the audience. Do you have questions? Question from my side first. Um, we see a lot of rules coming up. We see a lot of <laughs> new um, products we have to think about. Is this a threat or an opportunity for the industry? <laughs> That's a very good question. As I mentioned before, of course, it's a lot of work. So you have to adapt relatively quick to another huh, way of working. This is somehow a threat because, of course, more work it means you have to invest huh, in compliance. This means money. You have to hire people to get to know these rules and apply them. But it's also an opportunity. First of all, you will move to a more sustainable business where you know, for example, exactly all the hazardous substances you have in your products. Better to know than not to know, isn't it? And then the other point is European rules are much better than national rules. This is an opportunity to avoid national requirements and a fragmented market. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Vragen vanuit zaal? In twee. Thank you. An impressive lot of work you are doing in this organization. Uh, my question is, do you have also contacts with similar organizations outside Europe? Because an alignment with, for example, the United States, I think is very important, so that we don't have different rules in Europe, different rules, rules in the United States. Very good question again. Thank you for pointing that out. Lighting Europe is a member of the Global Lighting Association. So there is an association that represents all lighting regional associations. So we have the Chinese, we have the Japanese, we have the NIMA, NIMA is the North American, we have Brazil, we have India, we have Taiwan. We have been hosted by Taiwan uh, uh, now in, in September. It was amazing an experience there. So we indeed, we are talking to them. We have working groups together and we address basic uh, issues of relevance such as PSR rules, so LCA rules. So we are really pushing as Lighting Euro to make sure that everyone will align in the different regions around the same set of rules. So the Chinese will not have their own rules, the Americans another one, but we will have the same. So we are really fighting to get harmonized rules on LCA. And not only, we are also aligning on the future rules for eco-design. For example, also other countries, they want to regulate lighting, isn't it? Then which rules? We suggest possible rules in another working group in the GLA. We talk about night at light, difficult topic, the light pollution, light at light. We are aligning there as well, especially NEMA, so that our American colleagues are very concerned and they are in touch with dark sky. We want to contribute and open the dialogue as well. So again, in a, indeed, uh, cooperation is key, and we are doing that. Thank you. One other question, two other questions coming up. That's good, more and more. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering, um, are you also engaged in upcoming regulations on the application side of lighting? So, so uh, specifically outdoor light pollution, you, you mentioned it. But what is coming in that sense and are you engaged with that? Another very good question. We have a working group in uh, Lighting Europe which is called Value of Lighting. And they are really dedicated to everything that concerns systems. Systems and applications, indeed. For the moment, they are working on, uh, for example, green public procurement criteria for buildings, for office building in particular. So the uh, national authorities, you know, use green public procurement for their public procurement procedures. We are contributing to write the right criteria that include uh, that the, the, they can really give the right value to, to lighting, uh, lighting applications. So we are writing together with them. We have a position paper on outdoor lighting that will be published soon with our contributions how to have the best outdoor lighting. And light pollution, so night at light, as we like to call it, is indeed a very important topic. And my ambition, personal ambition, is to really make sure that 
this becomes a key topic in Lighting Europe in the coming months. I really see that as an opportunity for us because more and more countries are working at national level on rules to regulate outdoor lighting. This is more and more unacceptable that we receive different criteria and different rules. Europe can help. Lighting Europe can make sure that we have harmonized rules on outdoor lighting. That's my personal ambition. I also really, I'm really, really concerned about this topic about I have personal environmental ambitions. I really think the lighting industry should do everything possible to make sure that insects are not, you know, extinct and, and stuff like that. So we have to really engage. So personally, as a, an, an association. So we have a last question. A last question from the audience. The right to repair, how does that translate to um, repair your products in a repair cafe or do it yourself? So, the right to repair is mainly about making sure that uh, uh, consumers have always the chance to see their product repaired instead of being replaced. Uh, so, it's about obligations uh, for uh, uh, producers and, and retailers uh, to make sure that this right is really applied. Um, Reparability uh, requirements are indeed anyway applicable at product-specific legislation. So right to repair is a general legislation for all consumer products, doesn't concern lighting for the moment, we are not in the annex. Instead, we will receive product-specific rules on, on repair. So I expect more rules to, to, to see our luminous becoming more repairable indeed. And this is what we're also preparing for. We are preparing a reparability score. We are preparing reparability requirements so that we can also contribute to having the right rules on reparability. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you, there's more opportunity. I do it in Dutch. <laughs> er is gelegenheid om nog meer vragen te stellen. Mevrouw Scaroni is, toch, uh, Scaroni is nog niet uh, vertrokken. Dus u kunt ook in de beurszaal kunt u ook nog vragen aan haar stellen. And I want to thank you for your contribution to this uh, conference. It was very interesting. And as we know, light is visible. Light makes make things visible. And for that, it is always in the eye of the people. So that is makes it very important. Right. I want to give you this souvenir for this conference. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for coming thank to this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you we as appreciate. well.